everyone. It's so great to have Reverend Marcus Zill all the way from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, there's a couple of good songs about Tucson, Arizona, aren't there? Um, anyway, and uh, talking to us about the next steps and, and college and high school graduates and things of that nature. So we're so glad to have him with us today. Just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions, for Pastor Zill, we'll do a little Q&A at the end. So you've got a chat feature uh, down at the bottom on the toolbar. You can put your questions in the chat feature. We'll also give you an opportunity to interact with us there as well as or you can use the Q&A feature and type your question in there as well. We'll also give you a couple of links to uh, to uh, things there in that chat feature. Sandy, Deacon and Sandy will uh, share those with you today. And without any further ado, let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, there is always much change in the world. And in this season where graduations are happening left and right, we know that students will be moving off to uh, colleges and universities and, and community colleges and into the workforce. And there's so much around them uh, to lead them away from the, the home that they have in our congregations and our church families. We pray, O oh Lord, you bless our time today as we discuss these things, that you would make it fruitful for our lives and our work with these young people. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. All righty, take it away, Amen. Marcus. Well, great to be with all of you. And uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I have uh, served in campus ministry one way or the other for, uh, for 25 uh, plus years. Uh, recently had been the uh, director of campus ministry. Now I'm down in Tucson, Arizona, um, at the University of Arizona. And... Uh, talking about next steps and why, why, why the idea of next steps. And you're probably wondering, first of all, I have no idea why this thing is here. So you'll see this. I won't move it all the time, but I can't figure out how to get off the screen. Um, it's kind of a Mac uh, issue, I think. But um, anyways, why is there a moon? Um, one of the things that I always tell people, when, when somebody graduates from high school, they move on especially when they go to college. And I'm not going to talk exclusively about college because I think times are starting to change, actually. And I think COVID is going to have an impact on that. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit here. But the bottom line is that uh, when someone shows up at a, at a college, typical students show up, and we're talking not here at one of our Concordias, we're talking more specifically about they go to state university, wherever it might be. It's like a whole new world to them. It's like a, a surface that they've never seen. Um, they're, they, they, they don't know how to navigate this. It looks nothing like what they used to know at home. It, know, it looks nothing like what their former school used to look like. Everything is new. Everything is different. Um, different professors, different teachers, different uh, ways of doing things. Um, mom and dad aren't there to help you uh, get up and go to school and make sure that you do. Uh, you can skip a class if you want. Nobody's going to say anything. Uh, this is a this is a whole new world, and so. But I would I would like to to challenge you to think today, in a couple of ways in terms of how do we prepare our young people, whether they go to college or not. And you'll hear me say that again and again and again, whether they go to college or not. How do we prepare them to make these next steps? And the focus, you know, we will have somewhat of a focus on college, but uh, there are a great many young people that are choosing today um, in great numbers to not go to college, believe it or not. This is now a new thing. Um, so what do kids have to face going to college? I'm going to blitz through a couple of things, and I want to uh, kind of talk about things that I would um, pretty much tell a young person today if I have a chance to talk to them about about uh, here's some straight talk and advice about how to, how you can be prepared for your own walk and wherever you go. Um, kind of a, in the sense of almost like Proverbs. Um, then we're gonna talk about how do we as a congregation, how do we as congregation, as adults, um, pastors at a local uh, church, big or small, uh, rural, small town, uh, big inner city, doesn't really, really matter. But in terms of how, how do you prepare, how do you help them, uh, parents, how do you help your kids uh, make this transition to these, to these next steps? So um, what is the landscape going to look like? Let's assume they go to college. This is the world they're walking into. Um, they're walking into a world that is filled with pluralism. 
there is no right or wrong anymore, a postmodern world that questions the idea of, of what, what is truth, Pilate's ultimate question. Well, what is truth? Um, before everything in life was black and white, uh, good and bad. Today, as you know from the news, I mean, we're having fights over, I mean, who would have thought uh, even um, in the era, years past uh, after Roe v. Wade, we'd, Wade, we would be sitting here arguing whether or not somebody should be aborted right up uh, to the moment of birth. Um, so there's, there's this whole idea that truth is completely subjective. It's completely what you want it to be. If you don't like history, you rewrite it. If you don't like the nomenclature, you change it. If you don't like your gender, you decide to call yourself something different. And so whether you go to college or not, these are kind of the, uh, the pitfalls, uh, the things, the roadblocks that are keeping you and, and kind of staring you at the face as you're on this uh, new road as you're trying to figure out your, your next steps. Um, there is very much an ethic of emotivism today if you haven't noticed that uh, we don't debate things anymore for real, uh, what we do is we just yell at each other. And whoever has the most, um, whoever has the most, uh, um, has the most people on the side or they, 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 they cry better than the other people or they um, speak louder than the other people, we shout at each other. We don't actually talk about, okay, here are the facts of the things. Uh, we even do this in our, uh, presidential elections. We don't, we don't debate and present an idea and talk about the merits or demerits of the idea. What we do is we just stand it. And we certainly don't talk to each other. We just have opposing viewpoints and everybody kind of lobs grenades uh, wherever they wish um, and emotes rather than really talking to one another. Um, we have seen the privatization of virtues. Virtue used to be something that, uh, that, was, that was kind of defined by the culture. And the culture was influenced in large part by the church. Um, now our virtues um, are private. They can be whatever you want. Uh, your virtue is your own, not something that's outside of you that you seek to uphold. Um, truth has become subjective uh, rather than objective. Um, 20 years ago, we never talked about your truth or your reality, but now we do talk about people having their truth and their reality rather than than truth that's outside of any one person. Um, yeah, you can find hostile professors. Um, the vast majority, um, some of the statistics I've seen are 80, 90% of many of the professors at some of our state schools are, at least, if, if not borderline, perhaps even leaning towards hostile against um, uh, traditional faith, especially when it has to do with uh, uh, conservative social values. Um, we very much live in a culture of me, 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 me. Um, cancel culture. If you uh, think about doing anything, uh, you know, Roman Catholic Church the last few weeks has been dealing with, uh, with people wanting to try to shut down their services because they are pro-life. Um, so if you don't like it, you just try to rally the troops and you use your emotiveness that we used to call a debate and instead use it to try to shut somebody down uh, and to scare them out of existence and to simply run away. Um, there is this thing, and this is true, and you can see how this is going to start populating the screen here, the new COVID normal. Um, the level of anxiety among our young people is enormous. Um, most, not every school is back, back to completely normal. Um, in, in many cases, uh, masks are still required on most campuses. Uh, some places here at the University of Arizona, we aren't even um, allowed to meet in, in many of the same ways that we used to. It's, 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 it's almost like we're on perpetual lockdown or at least some semblance of it. So COVID has become, you know, for, for students that showed up a year or two ago, they don't know any different. If you think about it, we remember, some of you remember college, what college was like when we all oh, our freshman year, our sophomore year, we'll think about what the freshman and sophomore year has been like for um, those um, freshmen and sophomores today. Um, and so Again, as we look at the moon's surface and we see all the clutter that can be there, uh, this is what all of those things look like when you throw them together. And so this is what a young person in my mind is looking at when they're trying to step onto a college campus. They, first of all, yes, they see this whole new world and it looks beautiful and it's, it's exciting and it's glorious and it's, it's, a, it's illuminative. 
and they can't wait to go there and, and step down and take that one small step for man, you know, in their life. But yet they're confronted with all of this clutter uh, that is unlike anything. Maybe they've experienced it a little bit, but is ultimately unlike anything they've really had to deal with uh, before in their life. And so as we talk about here today, how do we prepare them uh, for, for the next steps? The next steps that they're going to take, what direction uh, are they going to go when they when they land on the moon's surface that is a school or a job or whatever vocation they do? How are they going to uh, um, decide which directions to take? Uh, what are, how are they going to ground themselves? And in reality, that's what it's about. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's 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 no uh, it's no secret that we lose many of our young people um, through this whole through this whole eighteen to twenty five ish. Um, uh, era in their life, uh, where they go off to college, they go off, they, they went off to the moon's surface, and we can never find them again. Uh, we don't know where they've gone. And uh, God willing, many of them do come back. Um, a few of them do stay strong in the faith, but unfortunately, the vast majority uh, do not. They become, they become overcome by uh, much of what they have to face on the moon's surface. Um, that's why many of our campus ministries exist. It's why I was ever interested in it in the first place. Because uh, I wanted to be there in the middle of this. Hey, I can I can do this. I wanted to be there in the middle of all of this to try to help stand in the way and help them so that as they decide which way to go, um, that they make good choices and uh, make good turns in their life for the better. So here are some things that I would tell, um, and this can be made available after the fact if you don't want to write it down. Um, this is what I try to share with young people based on my 25 uh, plus years of experience. I always try to tell them when they're heading off to college, uh, uh, job number one in your life is not to be a student. Everybody says it is to be a student. I say, no, job number one is to remain in the faith. Um, to be honest, I could care less if somebody continues on as a student or not if they lose their faith. Um, and so that is, that is completely job number one. Um, job number two, well, not so much job number two, but here's a, another thing that I share with them. Start, start the decision-making process early. This is something you can share with your young people and you can glean from this. Visit churches and campus ministries where you might go to school. One of the, the last things that people do is think about where they're going to go to church if they go to college. They just decide where they're going to college for whatever reason. Uh, sports, scholarship, close to a boyfriend, close to a girlfriend, close to home, far from home, uh, whatever it is. And then they think, okay, now we're now, now maybe where do I think I should be going to church? And uh, I would love nothing more, uh, if I have, a, have anything to say about it, to try to convince people to, to do, it a, do it the opposite way. Uh, make, make one of the first things you do uh, when you go on visits. Um, there's ways of looking up whether or not there's an LCMS church. Do we have a, a campus ministry? Of course, sometimes we have churches, but we don't have a quote unquote campus ministry, but the ministry is still taking place. Uh, the bottom line is you're going to need support. And, uh, and we want you to have that. And uh, there's probably no greater support than you can have with that. Um, and so starting the decision making process early and visiting the churches and campus ministries where you might go to school. And let's say as a parent that you start, let's say in your sophomore year, let's drive a couple hours this weekend, and we're going to go to the University of Iowa or wherever it is, and we're going to go to their campus ministry. Why, Dad? I haven't thought about going to Iowa. That's okay. I want you to see what a campus ministry looks like. Even if you don't end up going to that school, I think it's helpful for them to just kind of get the sense of, of, of what, what that can be like and what it might look like if they start looking at places where they don't have that. So taking these visits, getting them familiar with the idea that, uh, that, uh, that they need to find a church home when they go off to school, because mom and dad aren't going to be there. Their home pastor is not going to be there unless they go to school locally. Um, and so it is completely a whole new world. And uh, this needs to be an important decision, if not one of the most important ones. Um, this is a biggie. I can't emphasize this enough. It's okay to ask this question. Should I even go to college? Um, some people would say, why would you say that to a young person? 
I would say we better ask that question because we're losing 67, 60 to 70% of our young people from the faith who go off to a public education. And so if you think that we've got problems in many of our public schools at the high school, grade school, middle school level, um, just imagine um, how tough it is on the surface of that moon, of that new landscape at the college when they go off um, as an 18 year old far from home. Um, there are books being written, people asking, you know, is it worth the money? Uh, increasingly, many are saying, no, it's not. Um, Bill Bennett is one such author that has written a book that he goes through all the various disciplines and decide, but depending, let's say you want to be an engineer, probably need to go to a four-year college and get a degree. Want to be a plumber? Probably don't. Um, and I don't know about you, we had a plumber here at my place a little while ago. Man, they make pretty good money. And there is a there is a lot of a uh, lot of vocational work and jobs that uh, people are just stop they're stopping to do, and so there are many opportunities, and so the idea of asking that question should I even go to college, um, is I think important for every young person to ask even if they already figure they're probably going to go to college anyways. Um, I think it's important to ask. This is a major change in your life. If it's that important to go to college, it will become obvious that you should. Um, but what if, how many young people go off to college and in reality, they wish that they could just, they could start a vocation, they could be an apprentice, they could be doing all sorts of things. Um, Mike Rowe of the Dirty, Dirty Jobs World has um, all sorts of things that he's written and done that, to demonstrate that, uh, that the, the trade schools, um, uh, shorter period, um, shorter time periods and whatnot to, to learn how to gain certain skills and be out making money and on your, there's a lot of things that somebody can consider outside of college. And I guarantee you many, many of our young people are. Um, 20 years ago, not so much. Today, um, quite a bit. Make the number one factor. Um, this is kind of a repeat in choosing a college or where you might move or get a job where you will go to church on Sunday. Don't let this be the last thing. This can make a, make a huge difference in your life. Keep in mind, there's nothing wrong with community college and a lot that is actually preferable. Um, frankly, um, much of the teaching today, I don't know at the moment how many of you participants, what age you are or whatever. Um, but back in the day, I'm 55, community colleges uh, you know, uh, are, are much different today. Um, I know a young man who was a, uh, a PhD professor at a university town, um, world-class teacher, and he left the four-year school to go to a community college. Why? Because he didn't want to spend his time in a lab. He wanted to actually teach. And so the level of education at community colleges, especially, um, never mind the price, but especially if someone maybe doesn't know what they want to do, they're not quite ready to go off to a big state U with 50,000 students, there's a lot to be said for community colleges. They're, they're a, they're, the improvement is uh, over the last 30 years is, has been quite startling. Many of them have dorms now. Community colleges never used to have dorms. Now they have, many of them are building dorms because it's becoming a very, very, uh, very much a second option for, for young people. And in some cases, a first option, um, never mind being cheaper. Uh, I would tell a young person, um, I would encourage you too to say relationships matter during this time of great transition. Choose your friends wisely. They say when somebody goes to college that uh, uh, fifty percent of their friends they make in their first four, four weeks on campus. Uh, well, if that's the case, this is important. This is crucial. Uh, we are we really are who we choose to hang out with. Um, Keep in mind, um, many young people stop going to church while they're at college because they go to church because they think, well, I should go to church. And then they just say, well, it's not like back home. Well, of course, it's not going to be like back home. It's going to take time to get adjusted to a new congregation. Um, I'd say it'd take at least three times just to even, you know, kind of imagine going to school. You show up at college. It's your first week of college, your freshman year. You go to your first class. You don't know anybody. You're not quite sure where to go. Where is it okay to sit? You've never seen the teacher, the, the, the professor before, or met anybody there. Uh, you don't know what you're going to learn in the semester. There's a syllabus. Everything is new. 
Second time you go, oh, well, now I at least knew where to park and where to go and where I could sit. Third time you go, you're kind of like, okay, we're settling in here. We need to help them understand that, that it's going to take time, especially in many rural small town situations where maybe they've only gone to one church their whole life. It's going to take time to get familiar to a new situation. But uh, that's always been my little trick to say, look, did you ever get used to freshman 101 English, English 101? Well, yeah, it took me a couple times, a few times. Same is true with your life in a congregation. Give it a chance. Don't just decide not to go because, well, it's not like home. Um, this is uh, probably the best advice I could give um, outside of uh, your church life is uh, live a real life or you are not your social media profile. Uh, turn the phone off. A lot of young people are starting to realize that they need to do this instinctively, that it's not helping them. Um, gaming culture is another issue. I've seen honor students get uh, fail and get kicked out of college because they couldn't stop uh, putting their gaming devices down at night in actual study. So live a real life. You are not your social media profile. Um, if you go to college, don't overcommit and be a joiner of everything, especially in your first month. When you show to college, you need to prepare your young people that, you know, you need time to just learn to just deal with the transition. Uh, you don't need to join. You're, you're excited. You're there. Oh, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of that. It's, it's like going to the buffet for the first time and having to feel like I got to take one of everything. Uh, no, you don't. It's all going to be there at the next time. It's called the college cafeteria. You got time to put on that freshman 15. The bottom line is you don't have to join everything right away. And uh, a lot of young people struggle with uh, the stewardship of their time. Uh, the best thing you can do is, is help them understand they don't need to join all sorts of clubs and everything right off the bat. Of course, that means being especially careful with the Greek system. Um, I could do thousands, hundreds of webinars on, on issues related to those. Um, of course, they want to get you to join right away. Um, lots more can be said about that. Uh, most campus pastors will tell you that if somebody gets uber involved in a Greek, um, Greek life, um, chances are that it kind of becomes their little pseudo community, um, their communal life and almost a replacement for church. And yes, I do know that we have uh, pan-denominational Lutheran fraternities at about 10 or 12 schools out there. Um, not talking about those so much, but in terms of just the typical Greek situation, you just got to be careful with it at least if for no other reason from a time commitment standpoint. Um, I think this is really key. And I think we all struggle with this. We have become a culture that cares about degrees and having alphabet soup and having little uh, uh, diplomas uh, on a, framed on our walls. Um, but I would submit that whether you go to college or not, and I, I look young people right in the eye, I say, develop the joy for learning for learning's sake. Don't stop reading things that you want to read just to learn. A lot of young people, they, 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 they even get out of college. They don't know how to just read a book because why would you do that unless you had to? Because everything's been, learning has become this whole notion of, of not just becoming better and, and, and booting up all this, this helpful knowledge and, and increasing your understanding of your worldview. It's something you have to do to get by so you can move on, so you can get that diploma, so you can get out, so you can do whatever. Um, and so I really, I would really encourage you to, whether it's a confirmation class, um, um, if you have a, a, a youth, a kind of a youth board, at, a youth group at your church, um, Develop the joy of learning for learning's sake. Turn the TV off at night. As a family, read a book together. Just buy it. Everybody get my favorite book that I think everybody needs to read is C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. I would love for parents to sit down senior year of high school and just say, hey, we're going to sit down. We bought one of these for everybody. We're just going to read through it together and talk about it. Um, just read through it. Talk about it. Um, you'd be surprised at how beneficial that would be rather than just watching something on a screen together. Um, Commit to developing your devotional life and make it stick. The best modeling that you can do um, as parents is to model this. Um, a lot of young people end up someplace where they don't have somewhere decent to go to church, or maybe they're afraid 
but if they are used to at least having a, a devotional life that they that's kind of a part of who they are, um, that's something that they can fall back on. Well, here we go. Read Mere Christianity. I think everybody should read it before they go to college and even if you don't. In fact, I used to encourage my college students at the University of Wyoming when I was there for many years to read this every year of their life. I just think this book is that important for understanding our culture as well as what you're facing in college in terms of the atheists and the agnostics and the different worldviews that you face. Um, dare to think. I encourage people that it's okay to think for yourself. It's, it's okay to be the one person that disagrees with everybody. Um, don't give in to group think. Dare to think. Think for yourself. Um, your primary textbooks in life should always be these. Bible, catechism, and hymnal. Um, notice I didn't say anything about textbook at school. I'm just saying textbooks in life. We need to, to help our young people develop a library of, of things that they return to again and again for their sustenance that will be there so that they don't they don't end up like that math text, that algebra textbook that goes on the shelf or that they take back and get, uh, you know, 15 bucks back at the used bookstore. Uh, that is something that's a, that's a part of who they are because these are about texts that tell us about, um, about Jesus and his words and his wounds for us. Um, anxiety and depression is very real on or off campus. Uh, and this is climbing like you can't believe. Um, the last statistic that I saw is nearly 70% of all of our young people are, are, are diagnosed with some sort of anxiety or depression. If a young person says to you, well, you know, I, I have anxiety. This is not abnormal. This is the norm today. Um, in fact, it's becoming increasingly normal with many of, many of us. Um, so we have to encourage young people to have a well balance. Uh, teach them to take care of yourself physically and mentally um, and explain that that's why you're doing it. If you're going to hit, let's say you go to, uh, you know, you're going to have a, uh, an overnighter, you're going to go camping with a youth group or whatever, make, make rest, sleep, um, physical exertion, uh, having a devotional life. You, we have to teach young, our young people to kind of have the balance so that they just don't go all crazy when they get to the moon's surface. Um, keep in mind that the supreme virtue on campus will be tolerance, um, but expect to be treated with intolerance. You got to understand you're going to face that. Um, it's okay to look for a spouse. A lot of people, you know, I'm going to college. I want to meet people. I want to find a future spouse. Uh, remember that only God will teach you, though, what to look for and one and what a holy marriage actually is. Trust me, the University of Blank or blank state university, they are not going to teach you what a godly wife or a godly husband should look like. For that, you need home, you need church, you need families, you need mentors. Um, this, by the way, is, uh, is important for, uh, is an important reason to have a campus ministry. You know, uh, how many of us, we, we all want our young kids to grow up and, and, and find a good Christian spouse, uh, preferably a Lutheran one if possible. But we want them to find a good Christian spouse, and that's becoming increasingly tougher. Well, if you end up going to a place where they don't really have a, a good church or a decent campus ministry, and you could have, you've lost the opportunity to also uh, meet people. And trust me, a lot of the campus pastors out there, I don't know if we have any on here, we all to a degree view ourselves as, can I say this? To a degree, we, we help with the matchmaking department. <laughs> <laughs> We're all in this together. We want all of our young people to find a godly spouse. Um, but you're not going to learn about that in books and at school. You're going to learn it from seeing it modeled, uh, from being together where you're in good places, where you meet people, um, and what better place than to meet another person than where you go to church. In the meantime, and I look at them, I tell them, guard your sexuality and run away from anyone who tells you differently guard it. Um, we have to get this through to our young people. I, I'm tired of hearing the statistics that 90% 90, 90 plus of our young people have lost their virginity before they go to college. Um, it doesn't need to be that way. Um, it does not need to be that way, and we should never accept that. Um, 
se our sexuality is a gift and it's something to be appreciated and savored within the confines of marriage and for all the reasons God intended it. And we need to model that and make sure that they are, that's being upheld for them. Uh, but in the meantime, they need to learn to just say no. Um, I encourage them to not be a tourist, uh, whether they go to college or not, get involved in worthy projects, do something that you like to do, uh, be a part of a, you know, if you're a bicycle enthusiast, be a part of a, uh, the local bicycle club. If you want to, uh, um, if, if you miss uh, working with a brother or sister, be a big brother or sister to someone that needs one. That's a wonderful thing. I've seen a lot of college students do that. There are plenty of, don't be a tourist, get involved in the local life of your of your church, um, make a difference, um, and, and not just do things for yourself, but do some things for others. Um, keep in mind that God will not lie to you, but your professor might. I know it sounds like I'm harsh on professors. I do want to say that we have many, many wonderful professors out there, but a lot of young people show up and they think, well, if they teach it at state university, it must be true. Well, not necessarily. There's a lot of lies and untruths that are spoken uh, there, but God will not lie to you. Um, this is actually a big thing. You know, it's okay to fail. A lot of our young people, they go off to college and, and you know, they're top of their class, especially in a rural setting, maybe where they don't have as big a school, they're top of their class. They've been the star of the basketball team. They were on the volleyball team. They've done everything. They've got this wonderful resume and maybe they haven't experienced a lot of failure because they've done so well at everything at the local level. And they don't know how they don't know how to deal with what happens when they do fail. What happens when I've never gotten anything but A's and B's in my life, and my gosh, I got a C minus or a D plus in chemistry. Um, uh, it's okay to fail. It's a part of the growing process. We need to help them understand that it's okay, and they still apply themselves. Obviously, the biggest thing to help them understand is that their identity is in Christ. That's why campus ministry is there. Um, period. Yes, go explore the new world, but you have to remain tethered to Christ while you do so. So here, here's our college student remaining tethered to Christ, hopefully, while they are moving their way um, through, uh, through their life uh, on the moon and all the newness that it brings and as they take these new steps. Um, now, this isn't the end. I'm going to get into some things specifically for, for you guys. And yeah, please uh, please do uh, hit me up with those questions. I got about, I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes left and love to take your questions. I know it's a weird format to do it, but we can certainly do it. Uh, but we always have to help our young people understand that God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Um, real quick, um, moving on. Some tips to help adults prepare their youth. Obviously, you probably hopefully glean some things from what I would say directly to the youth. Um, do me a favor, teach the before and after of the rite of confirmation and its vows. Um, the rite of confirmation is a wonderful place to start about once we, I've always been very concerned that our young people, uh, seventh, eighth grade, whatever, and they, they stand up there and they're, they're ready to suffer all rather than fall away from the faith. And then we kind of, uh, it, it doesn't have any impact in, in their life in terms of giving them a sense of how serious this is. And in terms of us, even as a church, giving them things to do in the life of the church. Um, so be sure to, to take that seriously. Uh, when you have youth groups and whatnot, you know, I hate to say it, but they're teaching transgender issues. I mean, we're fighting right now, if you watch the news at all, um, like in Florida, the whole thing with Governor DeSantis and Disney and all that, what is it over? It's over whether or not we should be talking about young people transgendering when they're in third grade. Are you kidding me? We can't afford to save the serious stuff or the stuff that's tough to talk about till later. And if I got one thing to try to get across to all of you that work with young people, um, they know everything that you wonder if they do. If you're wondering it, they already know it because they're living in that world that maybe you aren't all the time. Don't save the serious stuff for later. And that, that the one thing that I can say that will help you with this, um, and I always tell people campus ministry takes three things. It takes the gospel, because if not, what's the point? Two, people that give enough, care enough to reach out 
to young people and to roll up their sleeves and be in their lives. And third, it takes a fire pit. And what I mean by that is, you know how you sit around, have a fire, sit around the fire pit, and you just let people talk about whatever they want to and ask whatever questions they want. Every campus ministry or every group of working with young people needs to have built-in opportunities for them to ask whatever they want, whatever the topic. Not just a chance to for us to kind of, you know, tell us what, here's what you guys need to know, but what kind of questions do you have? Because that's what's going to tell you what's on their mind and what's what they're wondering about. So don't save the serious stuff for later. We have had a big problem with this in our, in our church body for a long time, and I think it's perhaps inherent to our life together. You know, parents don't want to talk to the kids about the birds and the bees, and they think, well, maybe then I'll come up with confirmation. Well, in confirmation, the pastor or the other teachers are like, well, I don't want to do it. You know, the parents should do it. They're getting too old. Now it's too delicate. We'll let the school, next thing you know, the whole world, everybody else out there, the school, everybody else, public school, everybody else, uh, entertainment, everybody's teaching them these things except for us. It can't be that way. It just can't be that you can't save the serious stuff or the things that are a little bit harder to talk about. And frankly, if you're willing to talk to them about some of these serious things and let them know before they go to college, before they step out of your orb of, of influence, that they're going to know that, you know what, I can still call up my, my mom, my dad, my pastor back home, my teacher, my whoever, and know that, you know, if I have a problem, they're going to listen to me because they always wanted, they always did that before. This, this is really important. Young people have to have the opportunity to ask their questions. Start with where they're at or at least have it built in at some point in whatever you do for young people. And, and, and you know what? It doesn't take any planning. <laughs> it's just about being there. It's kind of a theology of presence. Uh, don't assume anything about your youth. Talk to them, listen to them, learn with them. Don't think that as long as your youth are just having fun, uh, that you're doing your best to keep them in the faith. Nope. Um, you, you've got to be in their life. Uh, they need mentors. Uh, this is another big thing I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, turn the TV off, parents. You know, um, I've been guilty of this. Um, I'm a big Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul fan. I was going back and, and re-watching and binging old, old, you know, I'm like, no, why am I doing this? I need to be doing other stuff with my family. Um, but we can't complain about our kids' gaming or social media habits if we're kind of doing the same thing and buffering with all these other things ourselves. We need, we need to model for our young people what we would hope they would do because we authentically do it ourselves. Um, teach not just Christian basics, but life basics. Sometimes the best conversations um, I've had with young people, especially college students, is when we were like um, helping to build a house or working on a habitat project together um, or working on some other sort of a service project. Um, and, and not just talking about Christianity. Uh, teach them that, it, that we can talk about other things too. Um, go to college, any college with them while they're in high school and talk through the issues they'll face. Um, you can't get young people on campuses enough to get, help them get familiar and get acclimated. Um, reminders from home still matter. Care packages rock and not just ones for college students. Any reminder, when you have young people that go off to college, or if they don't, and don't forget them. We have people in the military that we need to, you know, we need to treat them in much the same way. But what about your young person that decides that, uh, yeah, they do want to just be a plumber, um, or they're going to work their way up uh, in the restaurant business, or at a hotel, working in a hotel, you know, whatever. Don't forget them. They still may be of transition just because they don't go to college. And so I think we need to, to speak of this as college age, not not college per se, but college age, and that includes college, but isn't limited to it. Um, do things to help them learn about hard work. Not everything is learned in college. I can't say that enough, folks. I know I keep going there. Um, this is really huge. I beg you to involve your post-confirmation youth in the regular life of the church. They want to serve. This generation, they want to do things. They want to serve. I remember when I um, gave a young lady um, 
offering envelopes when she became a, uh, an associate member at our campus church in the University of Wyoming. And I gave her offering envelopes. And she's like, what's this? I thought these were just for parents. I'm like, you just became an associate member of our church. We figured you'd want to contribute. In fact, you just kind of promised that, that you would as you're able. And she, she was like, so I, so I get these? I'm like, yeah, give as you're able and as your heart desires. And she started dancing. She was so excited because she said, this is this what it feels like to be an adult? Sometimes I think we keep our young people. We want to keep them too young. They show up at confirmation. They say they are willing to suffer all, even the faith. I mean, even death rather than fall away from the faith. But yet we're afraid to get them involved as ushers, musicians, you know, all sorts of different things in the life of the church. Don't wait. They want to serve. And if we don't give them the chance to feel involved, they will go somewhere else. And that's certainly not what we need. Raise the bar in terms of what you teach them. And yes, do tackle sexuality issues and topics. You can't skip it. Sorry. And teach it positively. Not just the don't do this, but uphold God's gift of marriage for the, the, the diamond in the rough that it is that we wish that everyone would return to, that, that uh, we would uphold it for what it is. Um, teach the table of duties and the doctrine of vocation. I can't stress that enough. If you have a youth group, your junior, senior year, spend a lot of time on this with young people. It's not just about, you know, going to college, but they, they don't stop being a brother and sister. They don't stop being a son or daughter when they go to college. They don't stop having neighbors when they go to college. They need to consider the table of duties and not just think of themselves as a, a student that is a, a has one thing on their mind. Uh, teach your youth how to do a devotion. I mentioned this before by modeling it to them often. Um, I spent one year before I was a campus pastor and I taught the entirety of a confirmation instruction through, through a devotional life. It was an hour long devotion every week. And in the middle of it, we had the catechesis. Uh, anyway, anything we can do to teach them that our our life in Christ is, is not like schoolwork, uh, is I think very helpful. Um, get in touch with the campus ministry or local congregation where they're going to college or not as early as possible. And when they go there, take time out and go visit them. Go visit them um, and show them that you're happy to go to college, go to college and go to church with them. Give them space, almost done here, and I can't wait to get to your questions. Um, Give them space while at college or if they don't go to college, but not too much. Drop them random texts. Um, I've done this when I've waited at a dentist office before. I just sit there and go, okay, just wanted you to drop you a note, see how you're doing. I hope you're doing well. Um, you know, you know, I'm always here for you. Things like that. You'd be amazed at how much um, that. So don't forget them when they go off to college. Don't assume that some campus pastor is, is really connecting with them either. Just don't. Don't assume anything. Um, help them learn how to seek mentors, faithful ones. Um, again, I, I hate to quote statistics unless they agree with what I already thought, uh, which is what we all do. But most of them will tell us that how important having one additional person outside of, of parent or a pastor that when you're going through this time together that you can, you can turn to. That could be that could be a, a grandma type back home at your home church that you always love talking about. It could be an aunt, an uncle. It could be someone that uh, you meet at your new church. Um, but it's nice to have some mentors um, that you can talk to in addition to those that are kind of obvious. Um, so that's pretty much it. I mean, I could go on and on, but um, Todd, why don't we get to the questions here and tackle some of these? All righty, sounds good. Uh, so get your questions in now for Pastor Zill, and we will address them forthwith. I really appreciated you bouncing around in the middle of that. Um, I, I love that accidental graphic that we've got. 
a uh, couple of questions that we've got. How can we uh, maybe 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 we can help folks understand what is uh, what is a way that they can read these books together? In fact, while you were presenting, I got on Amazon and ordered a couple extra copies of Mere Christianity. I've got a daughter who's going to be a senior this year, and I love that idea. So I already ordered them. <laughs> well, I that's a great question. I mean, I literally I you know a lot of these books you can find you know. Um, there's a great book, you know, G.K. Chesterton's Brave New Family is a wonderful, there's all sorts of wonderful classic and fairly simple books to read. Um, I just think sometimes we get so paralyzed thinking, well, I need study questions for something. Every time I look through study questions that come with a book or a, a, a curriculum, they never quite fit the questions that I have when I go through it. And I'm like, you know, if this is that good of a book, maybe we could just read through it together. And I mean, what do we do in Bible class? We go to Bible class, we read through it and we study the, you know, why can't we do that? And just, you know, I think it takes some of the, uh, so when I say how to read books together, I literally mean that. Um, I, I have tried in the past to say, everybody read this first chapter and then we'll talk about it and focus on a few things. And then of course, what happens? Half of everybody doesn't do it. They forget their book. And so I think it's, it's, it's nice to have something to read. Um, I used to kind of do a thing. And if, if I ever have a chance when I retire, I might do this is putting together like little 1500 word segments of great works of literature uh -huh. that every, every young pr things that you can read through, just read through, like I'm talking about and discuss it and it doesn't matter if somebody came to the last three and you know how it is well i missed the last three studies now i'm behind now i won't come until you start something new but that every you know i always tried to keep things kind of um, all inclusive in this one thing so you, none of my students ever felt like well i better not hang around because i wasn't here the last two weeks yeah i like that so, idea that's a good idea so reading through it together um, it sounds so simple. It's like, well, how do you, how do you do it? Well, you just read it out loud. And, and we're so, we're so not good at hearing things out loud. It's kind of wonderful to hear people read and speak and then take time. And, and I will take, if there are study questions or I read it in advance, then, then you can kind of develop a few things to talk about. Um, but you'd be surprised. Young people are very inquisitive. And if you have something stimulating to work through together, it's amazing how, um, you know, you, you, C.S. Lewis is full of it. You can, not full of it, but, uh, you know, you've got the screw tape letters. You've got all sorts of things that you can you can do um, in this regard. Uh, reading things like Bo Geertz is the Hammer of God that you can get from CPH, maybe some other fiction things. Um, I even think it's helpful, um, and I'm not a big fiction person, um, but, you know, people went back in the Harry Potter days or with this, uh, what is it, Strange, Strange, what, what's this movie? Yeah, uh, strange I'm not, something. Yeah, some people <laughs> want to kind of, you know, kind of talk through uh, things, uh, whether they, uh, you know, are responding to movies, uh, how to critique a movie from a Christian perspective. Uh, sometimes there's themes that you can draw out. Um, but it, it's, it's, I just, I guess I can't, uh, I can't, uh, encourage us enough um, to just to read together if nothing else you're modeling them that it's cool to read a book for no other reason than to read it and not have uh not getting tested yeah um and so uh, but i think mere christianity is a real good place to start and you can spend a whole year on it and everybody needs to know they just do no, i like that we actually did that um with our youth not too long ago, we started reading a book together and rather than do the what you said, oh, everybody read the first chapter and then we'll talk about it next time we get together. Nobody would have ever read it, especially these high school youth. They they just didn't go there. Well, they're too and, busy. And that was fine. We, we understood that. So we just started reading it together and it was a great study. We had a, a wonderful time reading through it and it, it ended up being uh, really valuable. So I love that. That's a great idea. Um, I know our our uh, our. Uh, attendee here who is asking the questions uh, uh, also asked about um, getting together is, uh, yeah, good good point, Sandy. Uh, Mere Christianity is available on audio, and if you buy the book, you can listen to it on audio for free. 
Um, so that's uh, or Audible, I mean. Um, yeah, that's it. I actually listened the last time I took a long trip in the car. I have uh, screw tape letters on CDs, and so I I listened to the screw tape letters there and back. Uh, it was kind of a fun trip. But well, uh, and that's that's another thing to point out. Road trips um, are kind of like fire pits. Yeah. If you go on a road trip with your young people, I mean, how many times haven't some of you, even with your own families, you're going on vacation, you're scrambling around, oh my gosh, we got to get out of here. We're not going to get to where we need to get. And then you get in the car and you all kind of like, and then you just yeah. start having a conversation because you're kind of trapped together. I would love to trap people together to where all right. they can do is just talk. But you can also do that by listening to things like that when you're on a road trip together or, you know, it's just, we need to find ways to kind of draw ourselves together to learn together. Um, and, you know, sometimes reading things out loud together, I think it's just very, very helpful. I, I, I don't know how to completely wrap my head around why it, it just, it's so different than reading on your own. Uh, yeah. I agreed. And then you can start bouncing questions and ideas because everybody has a different thought about a different thing. And so that's a, that's a great way to bounce it back and forth. Uh, also, I love your your idea of the mentors. That's something we started here. And, and in our last parish, we started doing what we call prayer partners, where we assign all the way down to preschool, uh, all the way up to seniors, well, in, into college age and, and kids that graduate, we assign them a prayer partner with the thoughts that they're going to walk together all along this whole path and eventually uh, uh they'll be they'll be able to be a mentor with them as they continue on so um that's been kind of fun a non-familial uh, well think about it if, if you have if in your parish um pastor colbaum if you have let's say you have a like i don't know how to do woodworking okay i don't have a clue yep. to me my idea of woodworking is I throw wood on a fire and then I talk to people that, but if somebody wanted to really learn, Hey, I wish I, dad, do you know how to do, or somebody that knows cars? I don't know that either. Uh, it'd be kind of cool um, to be able to say, you know, intentionally think through who do we have in our congregation that is good with cars and to teach parents to say, Hey, dads, if you're like, pastor zill and you don't know squat about cars but melvin over here that's what he does for a living get your son to know melvin invite melvin hey melvin you want to come over for dinner and take a look at our car with us and show us show us around on our vehicle learn together with you i mean but if that can develop a mentor type everybody needs more that we just need we need mentors because there's going to be time in your life when you're not sure you can run you don't you don't know the pastor well enough you're scared to tell mom and dad you don't know who to run if you at least have another mentor in your life that's been around the block a little bit you got somebody you can talk to you bet yeah and i like i like your approach too of of really looking at the whole i i wrote down uh, looking at the whole system of the young person uh spiritual life uh uh you know their their faith life their church life their devotional life but also their academic life their work life you know all of those things all come together and and that was even one question uh you know more uh, you're um looking at uh how do we uh balance devotional life and you know if a person's at college if a young person's at college how do you balance you know wh where do you put your emphasis on on devotional life versus studying for your classes and and when you have that all in balance uh that's that's an important important thing well the thing is a devotion might only take you five ten minutes right <laughs> Yeah, Stud studying might take you uh, four hours. So, a lot longer. Um, I mean, I but used don't to, take out that five minutes just because you got a big test to study. Yeah, but for. this is this is where it's important. <laughs> if you can, this is why campus ministries are so important. You don't want to be, you know, looking at the moon surface. There, do you really want to go on that surface alone, or do you want to have a buddy to go with it through, or or, or a few people to to kind of navigate it with together and. I mean, how wonderful would it be if you had, um, you get to know somebody and they are also a Christian or, or, you know, wonderful if they're a Lutheran or you go to church together or whatever, and you're able to meet someone. Remember I, I said, you really are who you hang out with mm -hmm. and uh, you live together. 
a um, couple gals, three guys, whatever, and, and you you decide that, hey, we're going to, you know, every night we're going to find five minutes to just have a simple devotion together um, before we all go off and do whatever, whatever we do. Mm -hmm. um, but that's going to be really hard if you're just living by yourself or, or you don't have someone that shares your faith. And so that that's why these relationships are so important. Um, yeah. And I someone you can turn to. You, there are a lot of churches um, that will use uh, avenues like Google Hangouts or something like this with Zoom. Keep in mind, if somebody goes off to college, um, let's say you're a DCE, and maybe this is more for some of the bigger churches, but just because your kids have gone off to college, I mean, I'll use you as an example, Pastor Kohlbaum, because you're easy to use. <laughs> um, let's say you have three kids in college. What's from your church that are going somewhere? Maybe they're all at different schools. There's no re who's to keep you from doing what we're doing right now and talking to them. Right. And modeling a devote. Say, hey, once a week, I'm going to get together and then invite your your seniors in high school to do it too. And then they they kind of get used to it. And now even if they're at different schools, that's you with five or six people of a few high school or whatever spending 10, 15 minutes and just saying, hey, anybody got any questions? You want to pick my brain about anything? It, at the very least, I mean, I realize that Zoom isn't the best. I mean, it'd be so much better if we were all sitting around a fire pit right now, right? Uh, but we can't do that. Yes, but. But, <laughs> but let's use this technology to, you know, I said, texting them to say, how are you doing? You know, why, why not get together with your college students, um, even if it was once a month for half an hour? um to have a devotion and just get caught up as the they're still your they're still your church's young people even though they've gone off to college right yeah exactly and, uh, exactly so. well my church bells are telling me we are out of time for today so we're gonna have to wrap it up i know pastor zill would be happy to help you out with any questions you might have further or any ideas down the road please don't hesitate to get a hold of him. You can contact us and we can put you in contact with him. Uh, just email us at rstm at lcms.org and we'd be happy to help. Otherwise, uh, marcuszill at gmail.com. Uh, that will work as well. And uh, we'd be happy to, happy to connect you guys. If you want a copy of uh, the PowerPoint for today, we'd be happy to help you out with that as well, as well as the fact that this PowerPoint or this, uh, this webinar will be available on, uh, on a recording on our website, uh, lcms.org front slash RSTM and down in our webinar archives. That'll, this will be available in a few days. So again, Pastor Zell, thank you so much, my friend. I, I appreciate the uh, the Hawkeye plug in there. That was nice. <laughs> um, I, so uh, <laughs> uh, it's always good. And, and Pastor uh, Max there in uh, in Iowa City, he does a great job too. I, I, you know, we've got a lot of wonderful campus ministries. Yep. And if you go to the um, LCMS campus ministry area, the Synod's website, uh, you can get connected to, to them wherever they're at. So That's right. They're all over you. the place. Thank you, everyone, for caring about the young people, the church, in whatever capacity you have the chance to do so. You bet. And thank you, Pastor Zill, for all that you do and for helping us out today. God's blessings to you all. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to you later. Take care, everybody.